November 18, 1986, Newtown, Connecticut. Hella Crafts returns home from her job as a flight attendant, feeling super excited for the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday. But the next morning when Hella's family woke up, she was gone. Her friends and family were frantic. She was not the type of person to disappear without a trace. The only person who seemed less than concerned for Hella's well-being was her husband, Richard Crafts. When the police finally began looking into Mr. Crafts, they uncovered a murder so brutal that it was eventually adapted to the big screen in the 1996 award-winning film, Fargo. This is the story of Hella Crafts and the Woodchipper murder. Hey, you wanna hear a funny story? I filmed this video once already, two days ago, Tuesday. Filmed it, happy with it, sat down to edit. The first 30 minutes of footage look like this. So here I am, filming it again. But let's talk about something positive. Last week, we hit 100 subscribers on this channel. I always feel like I have to put kind of a disclaimer in that I understand that that's not a lot by YouTube standards, but to me, it means a lot that 100 people chose to subscribe to the channel and were interested in coming back to hear more. So I just wanna say thank you guys, it means a lot, and I'm excited to keep going and see where this whole thing goes. If you're new here, hi, my name is Jessica and welcome to my channel where I explore new true crime cases each week. Last week, we talked about Berlina Wallace and Mark Van Dongen. It was rough, I cried, so you know, there's that. If you're interested in that video, I will make sure to have it linked up here in the card for you. And if you're just interested in true crime in general, like me, and you'd like to join me back here each week, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. And with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into today's case. Hella Lork Nielsen was born on July 7th, 1947 in Charlottenland, Denmark. She was a kind, intelligent, and driven person with dreams to travel the world. As a young adult, she attended college in England before accepting a position as an au pair in France. But this job was only temporary. Her dreams of traveling came true when she accepted a position as a flight attendant for Capital Airways. From there, she applied for a job at Pan American Airways, or Pan Am. And Hella easily secured this job thanks to the experience she had gained with Capital Airways, as well as the fact that she was multilingual. Once she'd been formally hired by Pan Am, she was relocated to Miami, which was kind of a central location for a lot of Pan Am employees, many of which would stay in hotels surrounding the airport in between their flights. In 1969, when Hella was just 22 years old, she met a man named Richard Crafts at an airline convention. Richard was a 31-year-old airline pilot working for Eastern Airlines. Despite the age gap, or the fact that Richard was engaged, the two hit it off pretty quickly. They began dating, and because she wasn't really serious about him, she didn't feel like his engagement was a problem. But no one that was close to Hella could really understand what she actually even saw in Richard. He was standoffish with a bad temper and would often pick fights with Hella for no reason. But despite these oh-so-charming qualities, something about Richard really seemed to keep Hella interested. They dated on and off for about six years until 1975 when Hella found out she was pregnant and the two decided to get married. Now, I don't really know what happened to fiance number one, but something tells me that by the time everything was said and done here, she really isn't all that upset about how things played out for her. Once Richard and Hella were married, they settled down in Newtown, Connecticut with dreams of expanding their family. These dreams also came true for Hella. Over the next few years, she would give birth to three children, Andrew, Christina, and Thomas. And these children were the absolute light of Hella's life. She loved being a mother and she always prioritized being very involved with her children. She was active in their school PTAs and she was always in attendance for their sporting events or other extracurricular activities. Although they loved spending time and being involved with their children, Hella and Richard both still worked for their respective airlines, so they traveled and were gone a lot which led them to hire 19-year-old Dawn Marie Thomas as a live-in nanny so that she could be there for the children when Richard and Hella could not. Richard, in particular, was gone a lot. In addition to working as an airline pilot, Richard also worked as an auxiliary police officer for the Newtown Police Department before he switched roles to a part-time police officer at the Southbury Police Department. Hella and Richard were well-known, well-liked, and well-respected throughout their community. Especially Hella, she was warm and caring and people instantly kind of took a liking to her. From the outside looking in, it appeared as though Hella had it all. A happy family, a successful career, a beautiful home, 
and of course, a doting husband. Unfortunately, this just was not the case. In actuality, their relationship was quite strained. Richard was cold and physically abusive towards Hella, with a huge point of contention in their marriage being that despite the fact that the crafts were well off financially, Richard was ridiculously stingy with his money unless he was spending it on himself. He purchased whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, which was not a luxury that he allowed for Hella. He required Hella to budget her substantially smaller salary to pay for the children's expenses and household bills. But this actually really didn't even bother Hella. She loved her children and she would have done whatever she had to to support them. What Hella really hated was the fact that Richard was gone. A lot. Sometimes he would disappear for days at a time without so much as a word or an estimated return date. And even though Dick, sorry, Richard, even though Richard was a garbage husband, Hella really did her best to keep her composure for the sake of her children. But in 1985, she began to reach her breaking point as she started to suspect that Richard was having an affair. Suspicions that were all but confirmed when she noticed a phone number she didn't recognize on their phone bill. She looked into this further and discovered that the phone number belonged to a woman in New Jersey whom Richard was calling a lot. But instead of confronting Richard, she decided to take matters into her own hands. While she continued to track his phone conversations, Hella also contacted and eventually hired a divorce attorney named Diane Anderson. When she hired Diane in mid-1986, she explained to her that she was fairly confident that her husband was having an affair. Diane suggested that rather than make any rash decisions based off of a phone number and a hunch, that Hella hire a private investigator to find out if Richard really was running around slutting it up. And Hella's like, Dope. Do you know anyone? So Diane recommended a man named Keith Mayo, who was a former police officer turned private investigator. So Hella contacted Mr. Mayo, who agreed to follow Richard around and document any evidence he could find of Richard's affair. Cheater style. And once Keith began following Richard, it really didn't take him long to find the evidence that Hella needed. Keith was able to obtain surveillance photos of Richard and another woman holding hands and kissing and, you know, just... All of the things that you don't want to see your husband doing with another person. He took the photos and the information he'd gathered and wrapped them all up into a neat little devastating package for Hella. And a few days later, he and Hella met up so they could discuss what he had seen. When presented with the reality that her husband truly was having an affair, Hella broke down and sobbed as she realized that her marriage and effectively her life as she'd known it for the last 12 years was really over. She confided in her friends and her mother about what was going on and how she was feeling, and most importantly, about how scared she was. Hella's friend, Lena Johnson, specifically remembers a rather haunting conversation she had with Hella in the fall of 1986. During this conversation, Hella actually told Lena, quote, if anything happens to me, don't assume it was an accident, unquote. Hella then proceeded to serve Richard with divorce papers. She was done with his lies, done with his manipulation, and done with his abuse. But Richard was not going to give up his life and public image that easy. He refused to even acknowledge that the divorce was happening. He wouldn't sign or even look at the divorce papers. He was just living in his own little world, dodging these papers, acting like everything was fine. Eventually, it did seem like he was going to come around. He scheduled an appointment with the sheriff to pick up the divorce papers. But when it came down to it, Richard stood up the appointment. Just childish. Richard was... Shut up. Richard was supposedly worried that if the divorce went through, he wouldn't get to see his children, but I kind of feel like he more so just didn't want to be known as the jackass who cheated on his wife. Not that the reputation he actually ends up with is better even in the slightest, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In hopes of, you know, persuading Richard to act like a grown-up, Hella asked if they could sit down one-on-one -on -one and civilly discuss the possible terms of a divorce, and Richard agreed. The two made a plan to talk about this when Hella returned from her flight assignment to Frankfurt, Germany. Unfortunately for Hella, Richard had very different plans. Hella returned home from Frankfurt, Germany late in the evening on November 18th, 1986. Her co-worker dropped her off at her house and just remembers how excited Hella kept saying that she was for Thanksgiving. And honestly, same. But sadly, Hella wouldn't get to celebrate the holiday that she'd been so looking forward to. Because after her co-worker dropped her off that night, Hella Crafts was never seen again. 
The night Hella returned from Germany, there was a massive snowstorm in Connecticut. It was November, so snow in the Northeast certainly wasn't out of the question, but a snowstorm of this size in particular was pretty unusual for that time of year. It was so heavy that it actually knocked out power throughout most of Newtown. So around 6 a.m. the following morning, Richard woke up Don the nanny and asked for her help in getting the children ready so he could drop all of them off at his sister's house. This wasn't their typical routine, but since the power was out, Richard told them that it would be too cold for them all to stay at the house that day. As they were getting the children ready, Don asked Richard where Hella was. And Richard explained that she had already left for work like an hour earlier. Once everyone was ready, Richard dropped Dawn and the children off at his sister's house in Westport, where they still had power and, you know, heat. And as the day progressed, the power came back on in Newtown as well. Richard picked Dawn and the children up from his sister's around 7 p.m. and brought everybody back home. When they returned, Dawn realized that Hella still was not there, so she asked Richard again where his wife was. This time, he simply told her that he didn't know. Which, of course, seemed weird to Dawn that Richard didn't know where his wife was, but she didn't really become suspicious until she noticed a dark stain on the master bedroom carpet, which got even weirder a few days later when Richard started removing chunks of the carpet from the master bedroom, including the area that Dawn had noticed the stain. When Dawn asked Richard about the stain on the carpet, he attempted to explain it away by saying that he had spilled kerosene when trying to light a lamp during the power outage. And Dawn didn't argue or press the matter further, but she also didn't forget what she'd seen. More and more questions kept pouring in, especially when Hella missed her next flight assignment at work. This was incredibly out of character, which prompted her coworker Trudy to actually reach out to Richard to find out where Hella was. He explained that she had traveled to Denmark to be with her mother Elizabeth, who'd recently fallen ill, and that she would be back in a couple of days. But Trudy was a little hesitant to take that story at face value. If Hella really had gone to Denmark like Richard was claiming, why wouldn't she have called to let everyone know that she wasn't going to be at work? That just wasn't the type of person that Hella was, which made Trudy really suspicious of Richard's story. So when she saw that Hella's car had been parked in the Pan Am employee parking lot, she made a point to keep an eye on it so that she would know exactly if and when Hella returned. But she never did. The car remained untouched in that parking lot for several days. By this point, Hella's friends were really starting to worry about her. She was just not the type of person to disappear into thin air without so much as a word. They all kind of started talking and comparing stories, which finally made them realize that Richard had been giving everyone a different story as to where Hella actually was. To some people, she was in Denmark with her mom. To other people, she was visiting friends in the Canary Islands. And with some people, he really just gave up and told them that he had no idea. All of these inconsistencies led Hella's friends to give in to their suspicions, and they decided to reach out to her divorce attorney to find out if maybe she knew something that they didn't. When Diane found out that her client was missing, she immediately contacted Keith Mayo, the private investigator who had caught Richard with his girlfriend. And Keith, knowing that Richard was likely physically abusive towards Hella, feared the worst almost immediately. He went straight to the Newtown Police Department to file a missing persons report and really tried to stress how concerned he was for Hella's safety. But the police really wouldn't buy into the fact that Richard might hurt Hella. They thought that Keith was overreacting. They knew Richard. They'd worked with him for years. They knew him so well, in fact, that they actually refused to even start a formal investigation into Hella's whereabouts. So Keith followed his gut and took it upon himself to launch his own investigation into what may have happened to Hella. He kicked this whole thing off by speaking to the one person who probably knew Richard and Hella's relationship better than anyone, Don the nanny. When talking to Keith, Don held nothing back. She told him, everything she knew, right down to the stain on the now missing carpet and the chest freezer that had also gone missing from the Crafts home. And after hearing about the carpet, Keith was determined to find it. He assembled a group of people that all went out to the dump just to sift through garbage in hopes of finding these carpet pieces. And you know, it took them a few days, but they did eventually find pieces of carpet that they believed to be from the Crafts bedroom that appeared to have dried blood on them. They took the pieces to the Connecticut State Crime Lab where they were analyzed by Dr. Henry Lee, who disappointingly determined that these stains were not blood. It felt like a major setback at first, but because the town is so quiet and so uneventful, the media had caught wind of Hella's disappearance and they took the story and ran with it. The case became so publicized that residents of Newtown actually started putting pressure on police and demanding they search for answers. 
And this is why I believe so deeply that when the public gives a voice to families and victims, it matters. Because this public pressure is what finally got police to take the case seriously and open an investigation. On December 2nd, 1986, Richard was finally interviewed by the Major Crimes Unit three weeks after his wife had disappeared. I feel like cop-to-cop -cop loyalty is too strong sometimes. Usually if someone disappears, they're on the spouse like fucking white on rice. But because Richard had worked with them, it took them almost a month to take Hella's disappearance seriously and actually look into him, which is dumb. Not that the information Richard gave them in his interview was really helpful in finding her. Richard was very standoffish and withdrawn when it came to answering any questions about Hella, his marriage, the divorce, his affair. And when they asked him about the carpets, he just told them that he wanted to remove them and it was easier to do so in chunks rather than one big piece. As for all the inconsistent stories he'd told about where Hella was, he claimed that he was embarrassed. He didn't know where his wife was and he didn't feel like he should have to air his dirty laundry to the public. Because police were getting so little information from Richard, they requested that he provide them with a written statement detailing his last interactions with his wife, which he gave them, kinda. The statement was less than a page long. It was super short and super vague. Definitely not the detailed dissertation they were hoping for. Once he'd finished his paragraph, Richard bid his cop friends adieu and walked his happy ass right out of the interview. This actually turned out to be kind of a good thing. Because he'd come across like a giant fucking weirdo in his interview, they actually started to look more seriously into him as a possible person of interest, which led them to the discovery of some fairly dubious credit card purchases. Specifically, a new set of bedding that was purchased right after Hella disappeared, a large capacity freezer, and the rental of a large wood chipper caught their attention. With this information and the fact that if the divorce had actually gone through, Hella stood to gain half of their marital assets as well as Richard's pension, a warrant was issued and a search of the Kraft home and property was conducted on December 26th, 1986. The property was searched while Richard and his children were in Florida, which is where they had been celebrating the holidays. And the search itself was bizarre. The home was almost empty and the furniture that was there was strewn about with no real rhyme or reason. There were piles of dirty clothes all over the floor, there were dirty dishes in the sink, and all of the carpets had been removed. They were able to find a few pieces of carpet that had been removed from the Crafts' master bedroom, as well as a smear of blood on Richard Crafts' mattress. Blood that was later determined to be type O positive blood. Any guess who had type O positive blood? Our girl, Hella. Freshly washed towels in the bathroom were also sprayed with luminol and determined to have been recently soaked in blood. While all of this information was helpful to the case, what their search didn't turn up was the large capacity freezer that Richard had purchased right around the time of Hella's disappearance. When he returned to Connecticut, Richard was brought in for a polygraph test, which annoyingly he passed because they're unreliable. Luckily, this didn't sway the police's opinion that Richard Crafts was likely responsible for Hella's disappearance. The issue was that with no body, it was going to be hard for them to prove that Hella was dead, let alone that Richard had murdered her. But then, in January 1987, like a New Year's miracle, the police caught a break in the case. A man named Joseph Hine came forward with some information that proved to be pretty important to the case. Joseph was an employee for the city of Southbury. Because of this, he vividly remembered the snowstorm that took place the night Hella disappeared. He had been the one to plow the roads following the storm. He recalled that the roads had been completely deserted because of their hazardous condition. That is, until 3.30 a.m. when he came across a truck parked on River Road near Lake Zor. He described the truck itself as a U-Haul style truck with a wood chipper attached to the back. He thought it was weird, but he really didn't think too much into it until about two hours later when he'd circled back and it was still there. This time he actually slowed down to see what was going on. The roll-up door was open and a man in an orange hooded parka was throwing wood into the chipper, which he had positioned in a way that the chippings would be thrown into the river. And that was all Joseph managed to see before the man in the parka waved for him to go around. He obliged and left the truck, the wood chipper, and the weirdo in the parka behind him. But he couldn't shake the feeling that something had to be off about this man chipping wood in the middle of the night in such hazardous conditions. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't make it make sense. Because it doesn't. 
Investigators asked Joseph if he would be able to take them back to the exact location where he had seen this man. And when he did, his story was corroborated by a large pile of wood chips they found on the riverbank. But this pile of debris didn't appear to just be wood. There were also pieces of green plastic, bits of paper, and full envelopes that hadn't been shredded. And these envelopes were addressed to Hellacrafts. Dun dun dun! Realizing that this was a crime scene, the area was immediately roped off, and a forensic team began combing through every single piece of debris they could find on the banks. While most of what they found was in tiny fragments, they were able to recover more envelopes that were addressed to Hella. And everything they could find, every minuscule wood-chipped particle, was collected, cataloged, and sent to the crime lab for analysis. They ultimately recovered 2,600 blonde human hairs, 3 ounces of human tissue, 69 fragments of human bone, a piece of a human skull, a portion of a human finger, a painted fingernail, a piece of a toenail, and two teeth. On top of searching the banks, a police dive team also searched the river for one mile in each direction. And it's thorough police work like this that makes me annoyed that they didn't find the second barrel in the Terry Rasmussen case right away. Which isn't really the point here, but that really chops my ass, you know? Due to the temperature of the water, the divers could only safely go in for pretty short periods of time, but it was well worth it because at the bottom of the river, near the shore, they discovered a chainsaw that had had the serial number filed off. It was taken to the crime lab where, from in between the blades, they recovered blonde hair, human tissue, and blue fibers that appeared to be from the carpet Richard had removed from his master bedroom. They were also able to recover the serial number from the chainsaw, which ended up matching warranty paperwork that had been sent in by none other than Richard Crafts. At this point, it really didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what had likely happened to Hella. Investigators believe that early in the morning on November 19th, 1986, with their children asleep in the house, Richard Crafts bludgeoned Hella Crafts with a flashlight. Her head had likely brushed against the mattress as she fell, which left the smear of blood that was later discovered by police. She then bled onto the carpet, which left the stains that Richard later removed. He then wrapped her body in their bedding and carried her to the large capacity freezer. Once he'd cleaned up his master bedroom as best he could, he woke the children and the nanny and ushered them out of the house in order to give him time to dispose of Hella's body. He removed her from the freezer and took her somewhere to dismember her, no one's really quite sure where. But he then placed her into green trash bags and back into the freezer until nightfall. Assuming that the roads would be completely deserted, he pulled the truck with the wood chipper attached to it up to River Road. He then sent the bags containing his wife and the mother of his children through the wood chipper. Because he'd done his due diligence and frozen her body parts solid, this surprisingly wasn't as gruesome as one might think. I mean, it's fucked up and demented, so certainly don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. I'm just saying that it wasn't messy. You get it. When he was done, he began chipping wood in an effort to clean out the chipper. This is when he was seen by Joseph Hine. After Hine had driven away and Richard had finished chipping the wood, he then threw the chainsaw into the river. The only thing that cannot be accounted for is the large capacity freezer that Richard stored Hella's body in. To this day, it has never been found. On January 11th, 1987, police arrived at the home of Richard Crafts, complete with a warrant for his arrest. They surrounded his home before contacting him via telephone. They gave him the old, You're surrounded, come out with your hands up. To which he responded, I'm tired, I'll take care of it in the morning. Huh? Apparently it's not common knowledge, so I'll let you know. I don't really think that's a valid option. So they called him again and politely requested his surrender, to which he now angrily responded, Don't call me again. Click. So they proceeded to just keep calling. And I'll tell you what, he'd have had about three chances before I bust down the door and just drug his ass out. 9 p.m. and you want to play games and refuse to surrender to your murder charges? <laughs> nah, my team, we're not playing those games. As if I have ever been in a situation even kind of close to this. But you guys, this went on for hours. It took them three hours to finally get him to agree to come out in a few minutes. Again, any normal person wouldn't really see this as a valid option, but I guess if you're rich and white and a former cop, just do whatever you want. 
But what I find exceptionally annoying about all of this is the fact that his children were asleep in the home while he was playing this arrogant game of chicken with the cops. Finally, around 1 a.m., Richard's dumbass was taken into custody without incident. He was charged with Hella's murder and held on a $750,000 bond while awaiting his trial. And you guys, it is scary if you think about how close he came to actually getting away with this. If Joseph Hine hadn't seen him that night, the police would have had no real reason to search the dump site and they may have never found the debris left from the wood chipper. Richard's trial began in May of 1988, where the most important piece of evidence against him actually turned out to be a tooth that had been found along the Zora River banks. After meticulous analysis of the tooth and Hella's dental records, the tooth was determined to be a perfect match to one of Hella's. The best part about the tooth is that it had been found completely by accident. One of the investigators that was searching the banks had actually slipped and fallen down a small hill, and when he got up, the tooth was stuck to his hand. Had he not fallen in that exact spot, that tooth likely would have been overlooked. Isn't that magical? The tooth combined with the pieces of bone, tissue, and fibers found at the dump site came together into a strong enough argument that Helicrafts was dead and had been disposed of on those riverbanks. The trial concluded on June 23rd after 53 days. The jury deliberated for two weeks before coming to an 11-1 split. 11 to convict, all against one single juror that held out for an acquittal. When they couldn't come to an agreement, the juror that was holding out for the acquittal stormed out of the deliberation room and refused to return. And this dog and pony show forced a mistrial. But the prosecution honestly wasn't all that discouraged. They had faith in their case, so they just tried him again. This time the trial was moved to Norwalk, Connecticut in hopes of putting some distance in between the jury and the massive media coverage the case had garnered. And the second trial was basically just a carbon copy of the first. It lasted about two months and wrapped up on November 20th, 1989, which was just a few days past the three year anniversary of Helicraft's death. This time the jury deliberated for just eight hours before unanimously finding Richard Crafts guilty of the murder of his wife, Helicraft's. Richard's sister was awarded custody of the Kraft children, and at his sentencing in January of 1990, she actually begged the judge to give her brother the maximum sentence possible. And the judge responded by sentencing Richard to 50 years in state prison. In response to his sentence, he whined and cried that he was innocent, he'd been wrongfully portrayed as a cold-blooded killer. He then attempted to appeal his conviction in 1993, but was unsuccessful. He has always maintained his innocence and has always stuck to his original story. Well, one of his original stories. The one that said the Hella just disappeared. Now here's where shit gets aggravating. Due to an old sentencing law that allowed prison jobs and good behavior to earn prisoners time off their sentences, Richard was released in November of 2019 after serving 32 of his 50 years. That law has since been changed, but not before Richard managed to slip his slimy ass through and shave a decent chunk of his sentence off. He did have to participate in some like supervision programs, but as far as I'm aware, he became a totally free man in June of 2020. Well, as free as any of us were during the thick of the pandemic. Richard's pension from the airline was evenly dispersed amongst his three children, and the community also came together and raised $200,000 for Richard's sister to use in raising the children. And that, my friends, sums up the story of Richard and Hella Crafts. You'll have to let me know what you think of this case in the comments down below. Specifically, do you think Richard Crafts should have been able to get out of prison so soon? Because I sure as shit don't. I think rules like that should only benefit non-violent offenders. Call me crazy, but I don't think some asshat that murdered his wife, dismembered her body with a chainsaw, and then sent her through a wood chipper should ever be able to walk out of prison and resume a normal life. But I don't make the laws, I just sit here and <laughs> criticize them with no legal training or education whatsoever. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to Hella's story. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. I put out new true crime content each week and I would love to see you back here in my next video. Until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys.